welcome back to the start of another book and another playlist. Um, I, I don't like to have too many more than like 45 or 50. Bye cats. Chapters or, or videos within a playlist. Uh, I think beyond that it starts to get a little bit ridiculous to actually find what you're looking for. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's... I, I don't even know if there's a limit to how many videos can go into a playlist, but just in case, I, I like to start a new playlist every three or four books, probably. Unless it's the Purden series, in which case each book gets its own playlist, because those tend to be a lot longer. Anyway, we are starting... The Girl with the Silver Eyes by Willow Davis Roberts. This book, I, as I've said many, many times, I just, I, I picked it up. It was written in, I think I saw that it was, yeah, it was copyrighted in 1980, which means I was only somewhere between 9 and 11 when I read this book. So, I was born in 72, so I read it a couple of years after it came out, which for me is pretty good, because a lot of times I didn't find books at the library until they had been out for a while, and I do remember seeing it, and it was in paperback. I, I'm not sure if back then they even did children's books as hardcover first, but um, I remember picking it up and just reading the back of it and being like, eh. I, I don't see anything about horses in this, but I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. And from the very beginning of it, I just, I really identified with the character, not for the psychic abilities, although let me tell you, I spent so much time after I was done reading this book, um, staring intently at things to see if I could make them move with my mind. It never worked, but, uh, probably contributed to a lot of people thinking I was a little weirdo. But, I mean, it's a lot of the characteristics of the main character, Katie, in this book, I, I really identified with as a young girl because I was a bookworm, I was a loner, and most of my friends were um, animals or books, honestly. Which is fine, I mean... There's absolutely nothing wrong with being an introvert. I still am. <laughs> yeah, hence the fact that if you watch any of my other regular videos, you'll see a lot of my friends are um, birds, chipmunks, and squirrels. So, you know, nothing wrong with that. So, yeah, you'll probably get a lot more of my stupid little childhood anecdotes as we read this, just because it brings up a lot of both happy and sad memories, but mostly happy. I mean, I was, for all the fact that I was a real kind of loner as a kid, I don't feel like I had, I didn't really feel lonely all that often. I just didn't have a lot of friends. And the other reason I always identified with this book is because, as I think I mentioned, and I don't know if it even shows up in the videos, but my eyes are a very, very light blue. Um, and so, in my mind, it wasn't that much of a stretch to call them silver. <laughs> now I usually just claim them as gray because some, depending on what I wear... And honestly, my mood, some days they look blue, and some days they do look just gray. Anyway, let's jump into this book, The Girl with the Silver Eyes by Willow Davis Roberts, Chapter 1. Katie sat on the small balcony of apartment 2A, looking down over the front sidewalk. There was no yard except for a narrow strip of grass between the parking lot and the street. Nowhere to play. Her mother had been concerned about that, 
for although there was a park two blocks away, she didn't want Katie to go there alone. So, for the moment, she sat on the balcony, looking through the iron bars that formed the sides of it, and watching the activity on the street. Katie had always lived in the country, and she had liked that. This seemed interesting, however, and it was a nice street. It was wide and shaded with big trees, and most of the time there was not a lot of traffic. Except when people were going to work, of course, the way they were now. She saw Miss Katzenberger emerge from the front door below and head to the street. Katie hadn't met her yet, but she knew who she was. She had seen which apartment she went into, 3B, one floor up, and then had looked at the nameplate beside the door. Miss Katzenberger had red hair and was quite pretty. Katie admired pretty people like Miss Katzenberger and like her mother. She wasn't pretty herself. Even if she hadn't had to wear horn-rimmed glasses, she knew that her face was plain. Her hair was an ordinary color, kind of a pale tan that wasn't quite blonde and wasn't quite brown and was as straight as it was possible for hair to be. When she grew old enough to have a choice, she thought she might like to be a redhead, like Miss Kay, or her second choice, be a blonde like her mother. Hey, Joy, wait a minute. Katie pressed her face against the cold bars to see who was calling after Miss Kay. Oh, him. She had met Mr. Pollard. He lived in 3A, right across from Miss Kay, and she had collided with him on the stairs last night, her first whole day at the Cedars Apartments. He had dropped some of the papers he was carrying, and Katie had stepped on them, after which he had sworn at her. And then, when she had said nothing except, I'm sorry, and stared at him, Mr. Pollard quickly snatched up his papers and edged around her, almost running the rest of the way down. The way people often ran away from her, Katie thought. She had wondered if it would be different in the city, different from the way it had been at, at home, near Delaney. Oh, they didn't always run, exactly. When, but when they looked into her face, people often backed away, muttering things that she didn't understand and then would hurry off in some other direction. Mr. Pollard, who was almost bald on top, even though he wasn't very old yet, didn't see her now. He caught up with Miss Kay, and their voices carried clearly to the little balcony over their heads. I'm afraid I've missed my bus, he said. Can you give me a lift? Sure, Miss Kay agreed. She had a nice voice. I have to pick up my girlfriend Angie on the way. That's okay. Just as long as I get downtown. I had to stay up hours last night redoing all those papers that that brat walked on, and I overslept. Katie tightened her fingers on the bars. It had been just as much his fault as hers that they had run into each other. He had been running, too. Why were so many things her fault? They had stopped just a few yards out from the front edge of the balcony, and she could see the tops of their heads. One, a beautiful mass of red-gold curls, and the other with a few strands of hair combed across the bald spot. Hang on, do I have my keys? Miss Kay dug around in her purse. What brat are you talking about? The cute little girl in 2A? I thought she looked like a cute little owl with those glasses. The quiet type. I doubt if she'll be any trouble. Oh, there they are. Miss Kay held the keys up and jingled them. Katie always thought of people by their initials. It was easier, especially when they had names like Katzenberger. Mr. P shifted his briefcase to his other hand. Did you look at her? He said. Look at her eyes. Miss Kay stopped jingling the keys. No. What about them? They're silver. And they're weird. She's a weird kid. Silver eyes. Miss Kay looked at him. Mr. Pollard, have you been drinking? Of course I haven't. Look at the kid the next time you see her. She's got weird eyes, I tell you. And I thought you were going to call me Hal. They started walking towards the cars in the parking area. 
Miss K owned a light blue pinto. Katie had seen her get out of it yesterday. They were almost there when Mr. P gave a howl of pain and rage and doubled over, grabbing at his ankle. Then he turned and looked back towards the building. His eyes met Katie's, and there was fear and anger in them. He swore again, loudly enough she could hear it. I told you, there's something weird about that kid. I almost broke my ankle. Miss K stared at him in amazement. Well, I can see that, she said, but what did she have to do with it? You tripped on a rock. Yeah, yeah, I got hit in the ankle by a rock that wasn't there a minute ago. It just sort of, sort of slid right out into the middle of the sidewalk and hit me. He was still glaring at Katie as he rubbed at his injured ankle, hopping on one leg, then balancing against a post. Oh, for heaven's sake, you can't possibly be blaming a child for that, Miss Kay asked as she unlocked her car door and regarded him in exasperation. There wasn't any rock on the sidewalk a minute ago, was there? He said. Did you see it a minute ago? Did you ever see a rock on the sidewalk before? Well, no, Miss Kay said. But they're all around the edges of the flower beds. Something must have knocked one loose. What? Mr. P said. What was near it? It moved just now, just in time to hit my ankle. And she's up there watching us. Miss K lifted her gaze to the second floor balcony. For a moment, their eyes locked over the distance between them. Katie's face did not change expression. She could see Miss Kay thinking it over, and then she said, she's just a cute little girl. Cute? Are we talking about the same kid? Mr. P turned and stared at her as well, angry and baffled. I don't know how she does it, he said, but there is something wrong with her. Well, if you want to ride with me, come on, Miss Kay told him, and they got into the Pinto and drove away. Katie sat watching the two men from the apartments across the street, men who weren't paying attention to her. And then she remembered the rock that was still in the middle of the sidewalk, and she stared at it very hard until it began to move. It slid slowly at first, and then as Katie's power built up with increased effort, it spurted the rest of the way and lodged somewhat crookedly back on the edge of the flower bed. Katie had known long before she learned that by thinking about moving things, she could actually move them, and she had known that she was different from other kids. She knew that partially because the adults around her said so. She had lived with her mother and father until she was almost four, and she remembered that. Even though they had both been kind and affectionate, they had been puzzled by her behavior. She never cries, Monica Welker had said on more than one occasion when Katie was listening. I didn't want a fussy baby, but even when she was newborn, she never cried. At first, I was terrified that there was something wrong with her, mentally, I mean. But it wasn't be long before we could see that that wasn't true. And then she went too far the other way. I mean, Katie's so bright sometimes, she scares me. Katie, thinking about that, thought that Monica was confused. First, she was afraid that her baby was mentally challenged, and then she was equally afraid because she was super smart. She had, when she was little, called her parents Mama and Daddy. But now, Monica didn't seem like her mother at all. Her parents had been divorced when she was three, almost four, and her mother had gone to work and couldn't keep her. So Katie had gone to live with Daddy and Grandma Welker. But then Daddy had gone away to work somewhere else and she had lived just with Grandma. And Grandma, Grandma too, thought that she was peculiar. Well, she had lived with Grandma, Monica had come to see her sometimes, but it was clear that Katie made her nervous. Of course, Part of that, Katie realized, was her own fault. 
when she knew that some of the things that she did were things no other kid she met could do, maybe she could have stopped doing them. At least where other people could know about them anyway. But it was like having an itch and not scratching it. When she wanted to move something, the compulsion was too strong to resist. And usually she had already done it by the time she thought about consequences. Like the time her grandma had hurt her leg and was muttering about not wanting to leave her social security check in the mailbox for fear that those nasty Johnson boys would steal it on their way home from school. They would often walk along peeking into everyone's boxes to see what was in them, and more than once they had scattered the mail in the ditches near the road. I don't think I can walk that far, Grandma Welker had said, rubbing at the knee that she had twisted when she slipped on the cellar. I could go get it, Katie told her. No, no, I don't want you to go out there alone in this bad weather. You know what happened the last time. What had happened the last time was that a man had stopped and asked her if she needed a ride. He was a perfectly nice man. Katie knew that he was, and she hadn't gotten into the car, and the man had smiled and driven away. Katie had tried to explain that it was only he thought she was far from home, and it was cold and raining, and he was nice. But Grandma Welker was convinced he was a child molester. Katie was a little vague about what child molesters actually did, but she knew it was something unpleasant, and she had enough sense not to get into a car or walk off with a stranger, for heaven's sake. Grown-ups told you and told you things, and then acted as if you didn't have any brains at all, even when they said you were bright. So, not wanting to upset her grandma, Katie had said no more. But when the old woman was busy peeling potatoes for supper, Katie had sat in the window seat in the dining room and concentrated on the mailbox. The door of it stuck, and for a few minutes she thought that it wasn't going to open. But then it did, and she lifted the tan envelope that the government check always came in and wafted it noiselessly through the air, opened the door, brought it in, and deposited it on the dining room table. Grandma Wilker found it when she came in to set the table. She let out kind of a yelp, like their old dog Dusty when someone rocked on his tail and almost dropped the plate she was carrying. Where did that come from? she had demanded. Katie had turned from the window seat, pulling on her short skirt to cover her scabs on her knees. What? she said innocently. My check. My social security check? Katie stared at her blankly. Did the mailman bring it to the house? He must have, Katie said, seeing an easy way out. Only her grandmother had not left it at that. Did he give it to you? Did he knock on the door? Katie simply stared. She knew that it bothered the adults around her, the way she could keep her small face perfectly expressionless. Yet it seemed the safest thing to do most of the time. After a moment, her grandmother gave up and took the check away, muttering under her breath. Maybe, Katie thought, it would have been better to risk having the Johnson boys steal it than to have saved her grandma the walk to the mailbox. It had taken her a while to learn to be careful about what she moved. She knew that the name for moving things now. She had read it in a book, Telekinesis. That meant that she was able to move objects from one place to the other without touching them. At first, she hadn't realized that she was the only one that could do it. But when people would get upset or excited, it didn't take her long to catch on. There had been that time when Grandma Welker had been busy in the kitchen and had spoken to Katie over her shoulder. I need a clean handkerchief. Be a good girl. Run upstairs and get me one out of my drawer. And Katie, who was curled up in a rocking chair, munching an apple and reading Call of the Wild, had paused long enough to slide open the drawer, mentally search for the handkerchief, and waft the square of linen down the stairs and into Grandma's apron pocket. Katie, did you hear what I said? Run upstairs. There's a hanky in your pocket, Katie said, 
spitting out a seed and looking up long enough to see the amazement creep over her grandma's face when she felt it. Why, I declare it wasn't there a minute ago. She looked suspiciously at Katie, who was again engrossed in her book. I could see the edge of it sticking out, Katie said. Grandma had said no more, but the suspicion remained unspoken. As time went on, this peculiar ability of Katie's made more and more problems between them. When Katie learned how to turn off the light from the wall switch after she had gotten into bed and to turn the pages of her book without touching them, which she didn't really mean to do, at least not when someone was watching her, but sometimes she would forget. And she also learned to smooth her hair without using a hairbrush. Well, that made her grandmother nervous. Grandma had stopped taking her to church after the time the pages of Professor Gruton's sermon got all mixed up, even though Katie actually hadn't had anything to do with that. A breeze had come in through the open window since it was a hot day, and the pages had slithered off onto the floor, and when he picked them up, they were out of order. Of course, she had been responsible when Pro Pastor Gruton's hair had stood on end and seemed to do a dance. It had been a long, boring sermon, and Katie had been unable to keep her mind on it, so she had started entertaining herself. She didn't think anyone would have noticed. She had also stirred up the air currents carrying pollen from a field of ragweed, and people in the congregation had all grabbed for their handkerchiefs. Pastor Gruton was the sort of preacher who didn't like crying babies in his sermons or coughing or sneezing. He had paused and looked down on his flock with a frown. How could all of those people needed to sneeze at the same time? Just for the fun of it, that day Katie had shifted the air current so that pollen drifted under his nose, and when he sneezed, Pastor Gruton had to grab for his sermon before they sailed away, but they didn't actually slide till the next Sunday. On that day, Katie remembered how suspicious her grandma had been about the pastor's hair sat standing on end and dancing the Sunday before, since the windows had been closed by one of the deacons by that point. It had all come to a head after the service when Grandma had said that Katie could stay with old Mrs. Tanner down the road instead of going to church. Mrs. Tanner was bedridden, and Katie could read to her for an hour and a half a week on Sunday mornings. Katie didn't mind. She read very well. She had taught herself to read at the age of three, and Miss Tanner let her read anything she wanted. Katie read her Gentle Ben, The View from the Cherry Tree, and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and Mrs. Tanner fed her oatmeal cookies. They were store-bought. Not as good as homemade, but it was a kind thought. After those fateful Sundays, though she preferred the new arrangement, Katie knew that she had to be more careful. She had to lull Grandma Welker's suspicions by walking after things and not turning off the light from bed unless she was sure that her grandma was nowhere around. It was too late, though. Well, Grandma Welker didn't come right out and accuse Katie of being a witch or something like that, it was easy to see that she was not comfortable around her. Mr. and Mrs. Armbruster, the neighbors across the road, made it clear that they didn't want Katie around their place. Most of the things that they blamed on Katie were things that she didn't have anything to do with, just like when the wind blew Pastor Gruton's sermon pages around. Things like ripe fruit dropping onto Mr. Armbruster's head could happen to anyone who walked through an orchard at the right time of the year. If he hadn't seen Katie watching him right then, would he have thought she had anything to do with it? And she had not been the one that opened the gate and let the pigs out into the cornfield that was supposed to be growing silage for his cows. The Armbrewsters had never accused her of being a witch either. But Mr. Armbrewster did say, in Katie's hearing to Pastor Gruton, that he always seemed to be unlucky when she was around. Like so many of the people that Katie saw regularly, the Armbrewsters regarded her as someone to be afraid of. The same was true of the kids at school. Katie knew she would never be the type that joined in and became the leader of anything. 
She was good at games, but there was always someone that didn't like the way she played them. She didn't like balls coming at her hard and fast. One time, when she was in kinder kindergarten, she had been hit in the face with a softball, and her glasses had been broken, and she had gotten a black eye. That was before she had learned to make the ball veer off to one side. She knew that that could spoil the game, but somehow, like the other things she did, she just couldn't help it. When it seemed vital to move something, she moved it. So far, the rock she had sent out to hit Mr. P's ankle was the heaviest thing she had moved. The power was getting stronger. She was sure of that. Maybe someday she'd be able to move big things, like cars, or even people. Sitting there on the balcony of the Cedars apartments, Katie giggled, thinking about moving Mr. P suddenly up the stairs with his briefcase and his papers flying everywhere. She would never dare do anything like that, but it was amusing to think about. Katie! Monica's voice came through the open sliding glass doors behind her. Monica wanted Katie to call her Mama, the way she had when she was little, but so far Katie just couldn't do it. Grandma Welker had always called her Monica, and that was what Daddy had called her too, and Katie had come to think of her that way. She was, after six years of living apart, a stranger to Katie, really. Katie, what are you? Oh, honey, be careful. It's a long way down. Monica stood in the door, dressed for work in a smart summer suit of pale blue that made her eyes bluer and her hair blonder. There was an anxious expression on her face. How would I fall off? I'm sitting behind the bars, Katie asked. Are you ready to go? Yes, the sitter has just arrived. Come in and meet her. I told you. Katie said. I don't need a sitter. I'm almost ten, you know. Yes, yes, Monica said, but you're used to living in the country, and it's different in the city. All kinds of things can happen. I know all about child molesters and kidnappers and all of that, Katie said, and about keeping the doors locked and not admitting on the telephone that I'm home alone. I'm not stupid. Of course not, Monica told her. But I'll feel better if there's someone here with you. So indulge your old mother, will you, and put up with her? Katie got off the floor of the balcony and went inside with a sigh. It was silly and a needless expense to have a sitter for someone who was almost ten, especially when she knew Monica couldn't really afford it. She had already admitted that this apartment was the best that she could do, and they were going to have to cut down somewhere else to pay for it. Not that there was anything wrong with the apartment. It was very nice. Small, but nice. Monica had been living in a one-bedroom place, which was cheaper, and it had to find this one in a hurry when Grandma Welker had died. Katie's bedroom was so little that there was only room for a bed, a dresser, and a tiny desk. But it was considered a two-bedroom apartment. The pantry at Grandma's had been larger than Katie's new bedroom. Some of the closets had actually been at almost the same size. Miss Hornecker, this is my daughter Katie, Monica was saying. Katie, this is your new sitter, Miss Hornecker. Katie took one look at Mrs. H and knew she was going to hate her. And that is how the book begins. Like I said, I hope that everybody enjoys this book as much as I always have. Like, I know everybody has different taste in reading, etc., but this one's definitely one of my favorites. Anyway, we will jump back into that tomorrow. Maybe inside, maybe outside. Our weather's been really gray. I really would like to see the sun again because I, I joke that I'm solar powered and I swear since I've moved back north, I definitely feel like I'm solar powered. Like I remember when I lived down south, the sun was definitely the enemy because it was always so hot. But up here where we have four proper seasons, the sun is a very good friend that I am almost always extremely happy to see. Anyway, 
thank you for coming along with me on this new journey into a new book, and I will see you tomorrow.